This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. Our guest is Patrick Coburn, Middle East correspondent for The Independent, his latest piece, Starving in Syria, the biggest emergency in the U.N.'s history. Nermeen? We want to ask you, um, Patrick Coburn, about uh, Reporters Without Borders, uh, who just released, uh, has just revealed that at least 10 journalists and 35 citizen journalists have been killed in Syria in 2013. The group said 49 journalists were abducted in Syria, more than the rest of the world combined. In a statement, Reporters Without Borders said, quote, 2013 was a turning point because jihadi groups began kidnapping and murdering journalists in the so-called liberated zones for the first time since the start of the uprising in 2011. Patrick Coburn, could you talk about the dangers that journalists confront in Syria? And who is behind uh, the increasing strength of these jihadi groups in Syria? Yeah, it, it, I mean, over the last year, I'd put it even earlier, it's been getting more and more dangerous, I think, sort of. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, almost impossible these days for foreign journalists to visit rebel-held areas. Some have been picked up, you know, just when they cross the border. Also very threatening is the fact that some who thought they had protection from local rebel commanders have found that when they come to a checkpoint controlled by the jihadis, by um, the Islamic State of Iraq or some, and uh, the Levant or somebody like that, that it isn't just they who get kidnapped, but the, uh, some uh, Free Syrian Army commander with them and his men also get kidnapped. So the, the old protectors can't protect themselves and certainly can't protect foreign journalists. Why does it happen? Well, people are after ransom. I mean, a lot of these groups, you know, are under these different rubrics of Free Syrian Army or maybe Islamic Front or different are really sort of uh, part-time bandits. Some would say whole-time bandits. Uh, they change their colors depending on who's supplying them with money. Uh, they're prepared to uh, claim a strong religious belief or the opposite depending on where they can uh, get supplies. But all of these, one of the, the factors that's happening has been the criminalization of the military forces of the uh, Syrian opposition. And foreign journalists are the victims. Syrian journalists are the victims. And ordinary Syrians are the victims. In some senses, foreign journalists are now in a, uh, having the same uh, dangers inflicted on them that apply for anybody within the within the rebel areas. Uh, last month, Secretary of State John Kerry held talks in Saudi Arabia with King Abdullah. The meeting came amidst reported tensions between the two sides over Syria, Iran and the Israel-Palestine peace talks. At a news conference, Kerry said the United States and Saudi Arabia were in agreement. There is no difference about our mutually agreed upon objective in Syria. As I have said many times before, Assad has lost all legitimacy, and Assad must go. Nothing that we are doing with respect to this negotiation will alter or upset or get in the way of the relationship between the United States and Saudi Arabia and the relationship in this region. Uh, Patrick Coburn, you've also written about the differences, the growing differences between Saudi Arabia and the United States. And you have a piece headlined, Mass Murder in the Middle East is Funded by Our Friends, the Saudis. Can you elaborate on this? Sure. I find it, you know, it's one of the most extraordinary aspects of uh, the turmoil in the Middle East that uh, the Saudi backing for uh, extreme Sunni organizations, for jihadi organizations, um, isn't uh, opposed by the U.S. more vigorously. If you look at the official 9-11 Commission report, it said the main backers for Saudi, for al-Qaeda, are private Saudi donors and uh, donors in the, uh, the other Gulf states, the Sunni Gulf states. Um, Wikipedia released 
a memorandum from Hillary Clinton, I think in the uh, end of 2009, many years later. Wikileaks. And what Wikileaks. does it say? Exactly the same thing. The main backers for uh, Al Qaeda and type organizations of uh, Sunni organized fanatical jihadi groups is Saudi private donors in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf. Uh, and, you, you know, at the moment in Syria, Syria has taken over the funding of militant military groups who, in their own programs, say we are Sunni groups. They don't deny their sectarianism. Uh, they, um, they only seem to differ from al Qaeda in that uh, al Qaeda is independent and, uh, of Saudi Arabia, and these people are dependent on Saudi Arabia. So, I think that there's a whole series of Frankenstein monsters, both in Syria and in northern Iraq, that have been created and supported and aided by private citizens and at times the state in Saudi Arabia. But the U.S. has refused to do anything about this. It really is absurd to focus on tiny al-Qaeda groups in the hill villages of Yemen without looking at these very dangerous developments in northern Iraq and uh, eastern and northern Syria, where al-Qaeda and its affiliates, for the first time, control a great swathe of territory, really from the, the upper reaches of the Tigris River to the coast of the Mediterranean. This is a very big area. Uh, you know, it's an extraordinary development. Saudi Arabia has played a key role in this development, but there's been very little reaction in the U.S. or Western Europe or from these many um, uh, security agencies that are meant to be uh, focusing on al-Qaeda. Uh, Patrick Coleman, I'd just like to say that the, the statement by Hillary Clinton was, was released by, by WikiLeaks uh, and not Wikipedia. I wanted to ask you, though, why you think the U.S. has been relatively silent Sorry, on, uh, yeah. on Saudi's good. role, on Saudi Arabia's role. One of the things that you point out is that these Sunni jihadist groups principally target Shias, uh, not only in uh, Iraq, but also in Pakistan and in Syria, and that may in some sense account for U.S. silence. Could you talk about some of the other reasons? Yeah, I think that that's uh, one of the main reasons, and many of these killings of Shia get very little publicity. And then Saudi Arabia has, through a distribution of uh, uh, arms contracts through its uh, money, uh, sort of made itself part of the international establishment in which normally foreign leaders visiting Saudi Arabia uh, are, don't bring up these uh, delicate topics um, and put very little pressure on the Saudis to do anything about it. But, uh, you know, it is one of the, it enables the Saudis to really go on supporting jihadi organizations at the state or private level in the same way that they were doing in Afghanistan, post-Afghanistan, when they uh, supported the Taliban uh, before 9-11, after 9-11, um, during Iraq, after Iraq. There seems no end to it, but it's, it's, it is rather astonishing that there isn't less reaction from governments and the media in uh, the U.S. and Western Europe. Well, what about that? The issue of the media in the United States and how it covers Saudi Arabia. Yeah, well, much of the time it doesn't really cover Saudi Arabia, uh, and it's usually rather sort of uh, delicate coverage. Of course, the Saudis don't make it easy for a journalist to have access, um, but many of the uh, uh, facts about uh, Saudi Arabia's relationship uh, to al Qaeda and to uh, uh, Sunni uh, jihadi organizations uh, don't require any investigation. I mean, <laughs> you know, they're admitted, they're, uh, um, uh, they're in plain view, um, and uh, still nothing is done about it. You know, these are sort of attacks on uh, drone attacks or other attacks in northern Waziristan against al-Qaeda in um, Yemen, in Somalia, are really peripheral to the main problem, which is centered in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf. And the outcome of this support for these extreme organizations is to be seen in northern Iraq, 
uh, Western Iraq, which is now substantially under the control of al-Qaeda-linked organizations, and uh, across the border in Syria, right the way from uh, um, the, along the Euphrates River, uh, right to, uh, to Aleppo and to the Mediterranean coast. Uh, so, you know, it is extraordinary that al-Qaeda has been the great sort of winner uh, of the uh, conflict over the last, uh, whenever it is, since 9-11. And they've managed to make tr such tremendous gains without much opposition from Washington or London or Paris. Uh, before we conclude, Patrick Coburn, uh, I'd like to talk about some of the effects on activists, uh, uh, people who have been uh, opposed to the Assad regime uh, from the beginning of the, the uh, uh, opposition in 2011. Uh, in August, you appeared on Democracy mm. Now! with the prominent Syrian lawyer, human rights activist and leader of the anti-government protest movement, Razan Zaytouneh. She's since been reported missing in a rebel-controlled Damascus suburb. Zaytouneh disappeared from her apartment, along with her husband and two other activists, after receiving threats from Islamist groups. Witnesses say Zaytouneh's apartment was found ransacked, with laptops and other belongings removed. In August, on Democracy Now!, Zaytouneh described the carnage following the chemical attack in Ghouta. We started to visit the medical points in Ghouta, to where injured were removed. And we couldn't believe our eyes. I haven't seen such death in my whole life. People were lying on the ground, in hallways, on roadsides, in hundreds. There haven't been enough medical stuffs to treat them. Uh, Patrick Coburn, that was Razan Zaytoune speaking on Democracy Now! Uh, in August. She's since been reported missing. Uh, so could you talk about what's been happening to activists in Syria and also what you see as the prospects for these Geneva II talks in January, given the splintering of all of these groups? Well, of course, you know, it's a degrading of the Syrian revolution, which began as a popular uprising, that, uh, you know, that Razan should have been kidnapped, that some of the most eloquent, the most admired advocates of the uprising, of the opposition, should be targeted and kidnapped, not by the Assad government, but by their opponents by a group, uh, you know, the group that appears to have done it, actually, is, so far as I know, is funded by Saudi Arabia. I'm not saying the Saudis were involved. But these are the type of groups that have taken over the opposition. Uh, and they target uh, the people who are the most sort of eloquent advocates of uh, democracy and human rights within rebel-held areas. So this is a, an appalling development. Yeah, I mean, it, this is true. I mean, it's true in government-held areas as well that uh, human rights activists are also uh, targeted. But it's, um, you know, it, it's. Uh, I think it sh it shows that the opposition is imploding, becoming in some ways becoming more sectarian in a very vicious way. I think that the Geneva talks, or wherever they take place now, who is going to be talking? That uh, the Free Syrian Army, is, is it going to, you know, is, or the Syrian National Coalition, the groups that have been fostered by the U.S. and the West Europeans, uh, now can't uh, visit Syria? They're on the run. So if they turn up, uh, then this will be simply a pretense. They don't represent anybody. Uh, the Assad uh, government will uh, turn up, but are they really prepared to share power? Well, I doubt it, but I don't think that there's going to be anybody really uh, with whom they can have substantive discussions. These new groups, both al-Qaeda-linked uh, affiliates and the Saudi-backed groups, who are emerging as a powerful force, are both opposed to these talks. So I think these talks are dead on their feet, even before they start. And finally, you've just come out of Iraq. We just have a minute, but, I mean, almost every day in our headlines, the terrible violence in Iraq. Yesterday, 70 people died in a wave of attacks across Iraq. That was Monday. Many of them Shia preparing for an annual pilgr pilgrimage. The media has almost, uh, you know, wiped Iraq uh, off the map in terms of coverage. But uh, the 
violence inside is terrible. Can you talk about what you found there? Yes, I mean, it's sort of, it's getting worse and worse. It's uh, bombs everywhere, the uh, suicide bombing. I mean, the Iraqi security forces seem incapable of stopping it, but you have to say also that how do you stop suicide bombers? The U.S., even when it had substantial forces there, couldn't do it. What is happening is this increase in sectarianism. And, of course, Iraq is being infected by what is happening in Syria, which has given a great boost to al-Qaeda in Iraq and extreme fanatical sectarian uh, organizations that are massacring Shia. Patrick Coburn, we want to thank you for being with us, Middle East correspondent for The Independent. His latest piece headline, Starving in Syria, the Biggest Emergency in the U.N.'s History. We'll also link to your piece, Mass Murder in the Middle East, is funded by our friends, the Saudis. This is Democracy. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for watching this report from Democracy Now!, your daily independent global grassroots news hour. We don't accept advertising or corporate funding, but rather rely on donations from viewers like you. Please make your contribution by visiting democracynow.org today. We need your support today to keep bringing you this hard-hitting, in-depth reporting.